That's the one that was played. Did you find that at the wedding? At Merrill's? Yeah, the for communion. So it's an interesting story. Those of you who know Merrill, Merrill, uh, I didn't know this until like maybe three years ago, four years ago. But she said she had heard that song and she was in a season of life where she's basically had given up on church, given up on God. And then she heard lovely. And she said, everything turned around. She goes, I didn't know you could have intimacy with God like that. Oh, wow. She goes, it made me run back into basically run back into his arms. And, and then next thing you know, she's a worship leader and doing all sorts of amazing wow. things. And, um, that's humbling when you hear that as yeah. a songwriter. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> How God uses that stuff is amazing. Well, as you were, what, I'm, what I was seeing, because I don't normally see Jesus outside his emerald eyes, but as you were, then it's like I was embracing him and he dissolved into me, absorbed yeah. into me. Yeah, you know, as I was embracing him, that's what I was seeing. There was this. We used to do this more often. I need to encourage Stephen to do this more because there was this one particular instance where this happened. Where, uh, where before we start worship, we kind of lay out like some keys and some pads. It's just you know trying to get your mind just slowed down and your heart focused on him. And Stephen said, "Hey, we're going to re. Uh, you have a redeemed imagination because you're in God." So in your imagination, mm -hmm. picture Jesus standing in front of you. What does he look like? What's he doing? And uh, we would do this at lots of events, but at this one particular event, we were up in Connecticut. Uh, he's doing this, and, you know, he takes his time with it. So, like, if you see somebody that looks stern and disappointed, start over. You got the wrong guy. <laughs> you know? And look, let, let, take another look. Look for Jesus. Mm -hmm. See what he's doing. See what he's doing. Anyway. This couple came up to us afterwards and said, uh, we looked over during that time. Our son, who's eight, had his hands in the air, tears streaming down his face. Wow. And we looked over at, uh, after the first worship song, and his eyes were still closed, his hands were still up. After your last worship song, his hands were still up in the air, and his eyes closed, and tears just still streamed down his face. Oh. And then afterwards, they're like, are you okay, honey? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, they're like, why were you crying? He goes, I saw him. <laughs> wow. And then we had two or three other families come up and tell us the same thing about their children. Wow. The exact same thing. They're like at the same event. We're like, right. oh, it's like because Yeah, and it, I think most kids actually possess that at that age. Mm -hmm. And it's just we've not give we've not trained them in the right use of imagination or the full not or the fullness of what it can you be. You don't tell them. You don't really. We've never explored it. it. And you're like, yes, or it's easy for kids. Yeah, because you think, well, they're just going to fantasize. And... No, we have divine imagination. Divine imaginations. <laughs> and it's a tool just like our, just like. It is. Marconi discovered the radio wave. Right. It's the same way God speaks to us. We just, we've classified imagination as imaginary. Yeah. And not practical and useful in a way that God talks to us. Hey, Mom, the way, I, the way I think about it is with the children is they're fresh out of heaven. So they still know. They they still recognize. You know, they it's not, they're not. Right, right. Exactly. Christy's coming back in. Oh, great. But Christy. what I love is to see Christ here in you. And yes. you. Yeah. And you. And you back there. All that. Oh, you all. You know, this is this a form of worship to me. I'm not worshiping your flesh. We know that. But it's just so special to see Christ mm -hmm. in human form in us, you know, in him. I was at an it's event um, a couple summers ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reality is sinking in of this union <clears throat> that we have. And I've just felt like you have permission to explore these things. Mm -hmm. Don't reject it. Just explore and just see where the Lord takes you. But this is what I'm going to say. I've just got my buddy John. He's up. He's from Cincinnati. He's next to me on this side. On this side, I got a, a lady that's part of my team. We're uh, part of a cohort. Uh, she's from Chicago. And I'm like, wait a minute. The same Christ in me is the Christ in you and them. And But we're worshiping Christ. Mm -hmm. So what I did is while I'm we're worshiping and doing singing these songs, 
songs I don't even really like. I don't even like half worship music, you know. But I was like, what I was forcing myself to just pay attention. I turned my attention to Christ in the person next to me, not the person. Right. 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 I was like, okay, I'm in new, some new waters here. Am I allowed to do this? Because you feel like it, because it could be like, I'm not worshiping a human being. Right. You know? It's like, but I turned my, my gaze to, and my attention to the Christ in someone. I'm like, true. oh, and I had such, I got so wrecked in that moment. I looked at John, I go, John, this is going to sound really weird, but I like I just worshiped Christ inside me, and then I worshiped Christ inside you. I'm not worshiping myself for you. Right. I said, try it. He went, whoa. <laughs> he, he had a whoa experience. Because now, because what you're doing is, you call it psychosomatic. It gets locked in, and it becomes like the fixed knowing stuff. It's just yes. another tool right. to help it get become a fixed knowing, where you're like, I'm doing something, just like communion is a representation of something of spiritual realities but physical elements that represent spiritual realities when you physically posture yourself to when you're praying to the lord but you know he's here and your 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 focus is here not way out there start shifting your mind starts believing your heart starts believing that oh my gosh this is true this is real it is real the fullness of god dwells in me and you so i have to tell this story last night um Mike and I were at um, the Christian networking um, group that Ray invited me into. Um, it's for healthcare providers. Mm-hmm. And so it's a room full of Christian doctors and therapists and um, body workers of all sorts and just sharing stories about how, as healthcare workers, like especially after COVID, it's you have to think outside the box because normal medicine doesn't work anymore. And so we're all like, like, what do we do with these people? People, you know, we have all these chronic conditions now. Where was it? Um, this was last night. Where? Um, at Southeast. Tronda was there. Yeah. Yeah, me and Tronda were sitting together. We were going through the door. We were going through the door. Yeah. Yeah. We were there together. Um, and so just hearing some of these stories, um, uh, but there's a, a body worker guy that um, he's doing some really out of the box type things. Um, he um, just starting to know the Christ in him and what God can do with his hands mm-hmm. and listening to the Holy Spirit in his practice. Um, he shared two stories. Um, one of them was just incredible. He shared um, this this crazy statistic that 85 percent of our diseases are mental spiritual not physical um and so just being aware of that wow, in our 87%. 87 percent 87 is now it's astounding yeah. um but um so this patient of his um called him and said i'm going down i'm getting really sick i don't know what's wrong with me um and so then Shortly after, her husband brings her into his office, mm-hmm. carrying, and she's pretty much carrying her in, lays her on the table. She can't speak. And he said, my natural mind is thinking she's had a stroke. And so he said, he almost out of his mouth said, you just, we need to call the ambulance. She's had a stroke. She needs to go to the hospital. Wow. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you didn't pray for her yet. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was like, this woman's had a stroke broke you didn't ask me yet so he said okay i'm gonna pray for her he prayed for her and he said all of a sudden there was screeching howling writhing all this stuff coming from her and all of a sudden she takes a breath and sits up and starts talking she says i cannot just have it was she being delivered? Yes. Yeah, she experienced delivery. She was possessed. She yeah. had a chronic stronghold, and yes. she was healed of that. Yes. And he was like, my practice changed. Oh, my goodness. That's exactly right. Most of mm-hmm. A lot of it is that. A lot. I've been watching a woman on the Internet from South Africa. Her name is Amanda Baez, B-Y-D-U-Y-S, Baez. And I mean, she, I, I absolutely agree with everything she says. Really, she's talking about deliverance because she is delivering people, deliverance for people that have survived 
child abuse, mm. you know, just sexual child abuse, horrible, horrible stuff, you know, where they divide your brain and, and all that. And she, she, you know, it has, you know, Lord has taught her how to deliver these people and they're coming back because I talked to a psychologist one time and she said, kids like that never come back. Well, that would be right with a psychologist, not with the spirit. Like right. Yeah. And this woman is excellent. She is excellent. And really, I'll send you all her. Um, I just sent it to Dave. Dave really enjoyed it. Didn't you, Dave? Oh, he's not talking. No, I'm here. I just have to hit the button to, to unmute myself. Yes, absolutely. It's wonderful yeah. stuff. And it, it really related is. a whole lot to what I went through. So, yes. But something that struck a chord with me that you said is the things that we've been doing aren't working. Mm -hmm. So, what is it that the people that are practitioners are saying about what's not working? All like normal all medications and things like that. Like, it's, we're calling it the great breakup. Hmm. And people are breaking up with normal medicine, with normal medica medical practice, because um, and in our group, it's. Uh, we call it the system. Like Christian practitioners have to come out of the system because if you're a doctor that works for a hospital group, mm -hmm. there's a certain there way um, you are expected to practice. Yeah, protocols. It it's like a simply line almost. Yes, it's protocols, and there are certain things that you are allowed to do and things you're not allowed to do. And so Christians are, you know, so this group is like calling people out of the system and giving helps to yeah. people to start their own practices. And and I see it with Christian healthcare workers. God is calling. Everybody out to work for themselves, right. have their own practice. It's a revolution. It, it is. is because we, he, and he's in he more than one way. He's teaching us how to practice yes. and yeah. how to work in the healing ministry. Yes, right. It's phenomenal. It's every time I come, people have to be just more and more just listening to these people. It's just incredible. In, uh, God has is literally teaching us. In two weeks, I'm doing this. Um, online seminar with like maybe seven or eight other people from around the world that are participating in this thing. And it's all for uh, how to uh, partner in creativity with God. And so a lot of people thought because a lot of the ones that are presenting are they're more in the arts that it was going to be art centric, but it's not, it's all things. And so that we were on a call this morning, prepping for this seminar this morning. And I go, the phrase that keeps coming to me is new age, new systems, new age, New system. We're in a new age requires new systems, which means there is a breakup. Yeah, the old systems. Yeah. which because mm -hmm. you're going to get diminished returns and mm -hmm. far diminished returns and far diminished returns, and better start now learning what these new things are, so you're not dealing with so much frustration trying just to make the old thing work. Right, because it's not working. Well, I know it, and our son Danny is now set up for chemotherapy and radiation, and I wanted him healed. I wanted I wanted him delivered, really. And we well, pray for him. He still will be. Yeah. I know. But I, I hate the chemotherapy. You hate all of that. I do. But there's a process. Yeah. You know. Something happening. Mm-hmm. I know there's I'll tell you what it's what's happening. He's still full of himself. Right. He hasn't really come to the end of himself. He's still he's still powerful. You know, like I'm gonna rule things, you know, and yep. uh, so God has to break him down. I know that it's redemptive, but in I your know. mind and heart, you're like, okay, that was not the path that you saw in your mind. Well, I no, I don't even mind the path, okay? I just hate the medicine, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Do. especially yeah. the medicine. I know it, I, yep. I hate all that, I hate that. Yeah, but just stay focused that he's in the middle of his miracle. You well, know, he is. I know that. I mean, I already knew this because this is what I asked for. This is what I asked for. So it's just come. And I know this is this is because, you know, he really knows the Lord. And I really think he's got a prophetic spirit. I really do. A gift. He's real gifted. And he's a seer. But he's, you know, so full of, full of himself. You know, he hasn't come to the end of that yet. And I, I said, Lord, we've got to have this. He's got to. So whatever it takes, I'm always open for whatever it takes. It doesn't, you know, David knows that. I've laid all my children on the altar a hundred times. <laughs> whatever it takes. 
because I have to have them. I have to have my kids broken. So just like new, the old age has to go so that the new, this is a new dimension that people are moving into. And this is the, this is not the old. I mean, you right. can't remain the old. You know, this is a new spirit dimension. That's why I think everything is changing outwardly. It's because the spirit is changing us mm-hmm. inwardly and changing the body of Christ, you know, it, moving us into perfection. Right. And so uh, it happens. It happened in. If, did you all see uh, Luther, the movie? It was about Martin Luther. It's a really great movie. But anyway, when. You know, he finally went and started um, translating the Bible from, well, he was in Germany, so it was, uh, Latin yeah, Latin German. yeah, from Latin to German. And so, and started seeing the truth and, you know, just, he just, and so when, when, and then when he went back to the church, you know, to tell them that, that already it was changing in the church and everybody had gone in and thrown out most of what was in the church. Well, he didn't expect that, and he didn't really want that. He still wanted all the sacraments. He still wanted a whole lot to remain. But because the freedom was coming to the Catholic Church, yeah. then the freedom is going to come in the society. Second, It's like second hand, you know? But it comes. It, it both comes at the same time. So even medicine, so everything will is start to change. You know, everything will. And everything that we've used to have known could be obsolete, even in the medical field. And see, all the new, I mean, they just built this new building in here, you know, this Baptist huge thing. Well, wonder what's in there, because they know this is coming. They know it. So Of the one up here at the corner? mm Mm-hmm. That's for physical therapy. Is it? Is it just rehab? Is it just rehab? Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so, but, um, so nobody likes change. Nobody likes change. What? Yeah, you like change. Say, yeah, yeah, we do, like we it. do. But most people don't. We, you get rut, you get in your way, you're you're in ruts, and I you don't like it. Oh, well, I like change, too. I used to not. What, what, where was the turning point for you where you decided? When I decided that, um, I was going to pursue God for myself, mm-hmm. not wait for somebody to tell me about it. Mm-hmm. There you go. You know, I just start digging into the Word myself and having a relationship with the Holy Spirit and just acknowledging His presence in me and walking, letting Him walk things out through me changed everything. So now I'm just like, okay, you want to go over here? Let's go over here. Mm-hmm. You want to do something completely different? Like I've completely witnessed to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. 100 million percent. It's all, there's going to be an absolute download. It's going to be like uh, one day, a bunch of medical professionals are just going to have the, the switch flipped and there's going yeah. to be a Holy Spirit awakening. Yep. Well, it's happening. I mean, yeah. it's already happening. I mean, and in my practice, I mean, God had to push me off the cliff to go private practice because I was scared to death of all the bureaucracy and all the just really so much. Crates helping me work through that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Jill's group. But um it is frightening. But God just put me at the end of the club. It's a jump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm there. I'm over there. What, what, I'm what over medicine there. Um I'm a speech pathologist, but I do my functional therapy, which is a fringe niche thing that the medical world doesn't even really recognize yet. Yeah. So um but it's it partners with all the other body workers. It's a therapy, but yes. um anyway it's um we're just thinking outside the box. Like there's another way to do these things. There's, there's a different it's it's a different information source. Our body has fascia, our body has energy, our body has things other than bones and muscles that we're learning to utilize and yeah. work with and the Holy Spirit's teaching us. And it's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, today I had this boldness after hearing last night, I had this boldness because I have this, this man who um, he came into my practice in like eight out of 10 pain in his face um, and going through his tongue. And so most of what I do is um, um, oral motor stuff. Um, I reposition oral posture and then it resets things. But anyway, um, you punch him in the jaw. 
<laughs> Just kidding. So yeah. the Lord said. Um, so he was in eight out of ten pain in tears during my evaluation. Um, four months later, he was um, like one out of ten pain. Like we got him out of pain. Um, but he sat in that trip today and he goes, all oh, pain's back. And I went, no. Uh-uh. We're not having that. Yeah. And so I put it on the group mm-hmm. with the ladies. Right. Um, I prayed with him. I And he is a big, tough dude that he sat in my chair the first time. He's like, I dare you to help me. Mm-hmm. Like, this is my last straw. I've been to everybody else. What do you think you can do for me? And so then he, you know, he's like, I'm so discouraged. The pain's all back. And so I'm trying to think through what's going on. And the Holy Spirit's like, did you pray? Did you ask me? And so I don't know what his faith is. I don't. You don't have to. And so I said, I it's want you to know. It's easier that like, sometimes when they don't believe. I know. It's true. It's so much easier. It is. So I grabbed that big old tough guy's hand and I said, would you pray? He said, what did you say? He said, I'll do anything. So I prayed with him and he was in those eyes. And I don't don't know that. I don't know that. But um, I know that whenever we do the breathing exercises that I do, he, um, everything calm. And so I told him, I said, a lot of these things are spiritual. They are. And so after I talked, you know, heard that last night, that statistic, I was like, this has to be spiritual for him. Mm-hmm. I'm like, but you have to own this. And I told him that. I said, you have to tell this pain to go. And you have to accept healing from your creator. And that's how I left him out the door. Wow. So we'll see. Maybe his pain doesn't go away. Maybe it does, but maybe he accepts Christ in, in the yeah. mix. I don't know, but that's what God's doing. He's mixing it up. Y'all, I don't have that kind of boldness. Well, the thing of it is, I don't have that kind of boldness, but it's coming. And it's coming for so many Christian practitioners. It's coming for everybody. Right. It's coming for everybody in the medical field, in every field. It really is coming. All flesh. Yeah. Right. Yes. Because it's Joel chapter two. Yeah. It's me, chapter two. Okay. Spirit is pulling out on all flesh. So everything is changing. And will right. it? I mean, all of us are. And so, I mean, you know, I'm older. You think I don't like change. But yes, I'm I'm that because I know the flow of the Holy Spirit. You never know which way the Holy Spirit is going to go. And I love that. I love not knowing and not knowing what to do except in the moment. Living in the moment and not having presuppose. You know, I have to do this or I should do this or I have to take care of this and just see what is the Spirit doing? What is the Spirit doing here? What is the Holy Spirit doing there? What is the Holy Spirit doing? You see, and what it what is and, and let me tell you, Christians still they've got some demons. Mm-hmm. Christians have demons. I mean, why in the world would Paul say, Who shall deliver me? <laughs> he was a big Christian, wanted to be delivered from, you know, the, the performance. yeah, performance based acceptance, right? performance-based acceptance, really. And so being a good person, he couldn't deliver himself. So, right, none of us can. So anyway, um, and not changing the subject, but I'm going out to California. Bill is, I'm going to see Bill, and he's got a group of young people. And so he wants me to come and teach, which I will. And so... That's the first of August, and Jenny's going with me, and Ray's coming with me. Yeah, Ray Thompson's coming with me. Trying to get Matt to come too. You know. Good luck. So, yeah, I know. I know. He'll probably go. Watch him go. Yeah, he probably will. I mean, Dad wants to pay their way because he wants them to go so bad. He really wants them to go. So anyway, so we're we're expecting. You know, I mean. Really, what Bill has to teach is rare out there. Nobody, you would think out there, you know, where the big charismatic movement started, Azusa Street. And-
and you know all that mm -hmm. that you would think they would really but they're not rarely do people know the indwelling holy spirit they know the manifestations of the spirit they want to experience all that all the time but they do not know the indwelling the 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 Christ is who we are. Christ, our life. Christ is my life, not a part of me. It is it's who I am. You see, that's my true identity or spiritual identity. And so, and so anyway, I'm going out there the first through the fifth. You know, so anyway, but I was with Danny today and he complains about everything. And I just say nothing. So the day will come when he'll be praising. He wants me to pray. He wants all of us to pray for him. He wants us that. He wants that. So I'm just, I just know him too well. Yeah. And what he doesn't see yet, you know. And so that's what I want. I told the Lord I'm going to be the worst person you've had because I'm always going to want more, more. See? More. So I don't care what the cost. I have to have more. That's right. Well, I mean, think of the people that you know that don't know. I mean, don't you have that great desire and for them to really know? Well, okay, how are they going to? Unless the Holy Spirit does the work. Well, God's got to do the work. You know that. Well, it it might look really negative at first, a lot for a good while. It might be hard to take if it's your family. You see, you will suffer with them too. But you see, what the result is, is just, and I say what we're asking for is a radical transformation. It's radical. It's not, I mean, a new identity, a new me, you know, every, just like medical. This is all radical. See, that's what it blows most people, they can't take that. When you don't know the Holy Spirit and the ways of the Spirit, are always like that. You never know which way God's going to go or what's going to be next. That's really an adventure of faith. That's an adventure. And even in the negative, that I always know, I mean, this is a huge opportunity for God's glory. This is redemptive. Everything we suffer is redemptive. I mean, I think of people that don't know that. And, they, you know, all those people sitting there, in the office, you know, just dying on the inside. You could just tell I wanted to go and go around and touch each one of them and pray for each one of them. I didn't. Right. But if I'd heard, I would have. I would have, you know. And because that's important. It's important. To, you have to know. I won't, I won't just go do, unless I know. I mean, if it's spontaneous and I do it, I'll do it. Right. But you know, I'm just watching people and watching the whole thing. But it's redemptive. Mm -hmm. It's going to bring glory to God. It's going to transform our son. He's not going to physically die. He's going to have to die to who he thinks he is, which is radical. And my children, except for Dave, and he's been through hell and back a million times, but because, but because of that, he, he knows but the other ones think they do because they've heard me talk like this, you know, forever. But they don't. Don't yet know, except my Diane. My Diane does. Boy, she does, but she's been through hell. See, it's through hell that people find heaven, and that's strange. Stephen has a song called Hell and Back. You heard this? No. Or you've been, heard, you've been there. I've never heard it. I've been to hell and back. I will remind my past that you have been there, been there through it all. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. Wonderful one, because, you know, Stephen has. And he so has. a lot of times we're singing this at addiction recovery places, and they're like, yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, like like bikers singing at the top of their lives, I've been held back. But it's yeah. like, but it's true. See how that pain. But the thing of it is, because of it, when God delivers us, he fills us with such an anointing. He is, that Stephen has such an anointing. He just starts opening his mouth, yeah. and people start getting saved. <laughs> they do. They do. They do. 
he barely starts to sing. But it's it's so he's so powerful. Yeah. He just is. Power of the spirit. See, that's what I want for all my men. <laughs> I have a question for you. What? Uh, we read in the news lately about uh, Robert Morris. Uh, I read about another minister in Independence, Missouri. Uh, built a strong work and became president of the school board in this community. And then the things were revealed about, about sin. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked a brother about that. And he was telling me, well, he had heard that the, the strongest AG church in Springfield, Missouri, they had a men's meeting where some things were done that people, a lot of people objected to. So uh, last night I was talking to my buddy from 60 years ago in, uh, in Springfield, and I asked, I asked him about it. He says, yes, on the one hand, people were concerned about that. Some people left the church. But on the other hand, 75 people were saved during that meeting. Oh, wow. wow. So what is, you know, God is shaking kind of me. turning, really shaking. Oh, he want, he needs to. He absolutely needs to. Number one. Hasn't that been what we've been crying? Yes, exactly. Okay. Number one, our yeah. churches are lukewarm. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that think they are hot, you know, in the spirit, they're not. And they're, they, they might be, they're just not. I think... Honestly, you know, the devil has done a good work in the church to beat people up. And because they don't know who they are, and that is true, you don't, they don't really know who they are. And they don't preach it, and they don't teach people in who they really are. Then they're sliding backwards is what they're doing, and the devil has taken over many of the big churches. And God is shaking it. Let me tell you, I've told, I've told you all lots of times about my time out in California when um, I was teaching with Bill, and late at night I went to a, a, a coffee shop. And, and so at the coffee shop, there was hardly anybody there. All the young people were sitting at my feet hmm. because there were, they wanted to get close. And, you know, at a coffee shop, you had to sit at tables and stuff. And so they were just sitting all there. And I was sharing and teaching. And then all of a sudden, I I didn't realize it at the time, but the spirit, a spirit came on me. I did not realize it at the time because I was teaching. Proves that we have two minds. I can tell you that. Because the spirit was teaching at the same time. My mind was filled with just look at all these people under your feet. I could feel the pride. I could feel it rising in me. Okay? Now, most people would say that's sin and then fight it. <laughs> right? Wrong. That's the problem. They don't know what happened. And so I felt all that pride. You, When you are in charge of a group of people, and you're the big teacher, and everybody gives you all the accolades, you see, that is just the devil's playground. It is. And the thing of it is, and people just come up to you and uh, let me. So I experienced this and I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm thinking I'm trying to catch myself. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I hope Bill doesn't see me. I hate this. So it was two things happening at once. So then finally, but I, but the thing that I knew is I felt it and I was thinking it at the same time I was teaching. <laughs> OK, right. So. It made me realize exactly what happens to ministers. As soon as pride rises, the pride is the, the devil. And people do not know it. They do not know, and they fight it. A, more, a true minister would fight that. They would not want that. Oh, we can't have that. I don't want that. You see, but if you don't understand how to fight, Satan overcomes every time. If you don't understand you know that you don't you you it doesn't you have the authority, but we don't have the power. The spirit of God has the power. Yeah. That is the power. But you think you've got the power, you see, and then you start. And I'm telling you, then and when the devil takes over a minister like that, and it's easy for it to have for him to happen. It's easy. If I didn't know the difference, it God gave me that 
for several reasons. One reason, I always love what happens to me like this, because it gives me a platform to really be able to share with God's people exactly how we're tempted and how it not only Satan not only projects his thoughts in our mind, but he makes us feel it at the same time. Well, I mean, most people would say that's who I am. I mean, all the preachers would, wouldn't they? You know, see, well, even with the Holy Spirit, if you don't know the indwelling Holy Spirit, you know, you're still living in your feelings and just all the manifestations and you're just looking for new manifestations. You see what I'm saying? It's still an outer sense. So, so then the pride, I mean, it rises and then the devil, I mean, takes you over. I can understand how it happened. Honestly, with that, it gave me empathy for the ministers. And I'm thinking of Merrill and Schuyler that I really would love for us as a as a group to really have them covered because they're they're really young, very young. They're very, very young. They don't really they are. And I know that. And yeah. so I, I think as as a as a group that we just they we need to be their covering and stand in faith for them and pray for them and believe for them because they kind of don't know yet what's going to hit them, but it will, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you see what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so God and God has to shake it because our, because what's happening to the body of Christ, they're being dumbed down, <laughs> dumbed down, just like our kids in school. They're being dumbed down, you see. Nobody really understands. And and even the charismatics, they just live mostly in the spirit. Do they really teach the Bible? I don't, I don't, I don't hear anybody teaching the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a problem. That's the problem. I've and and that my whole life. When my father being a minister, I've grown up my whole life in church. And in the last two years, and especially in the last six months, I have learned more wow. from the scripture. Yes. Things I never saw. Wow. That's so great, Judy. That's what that's what God wants. I mean, the the Jesus revolution is truly to bring people to know that they are one with Christ, to understand how the devil absolutely tempts us in every which way he can understand you know i mean we have to have some kind of understanding of our enemy i was just thinking of you know uh, the, if you're on a football team i mean what do they do they go and look at how the other the opposing team their plays and what they do and what they don't do you know they're schooled on their enemy or it's not their enemy but their opposing person you know team so but we hardly are I'm, I'm not, not talking about us, but we hardly are. We don't understand or even temptation what's happening to us. And when it does come on us, we try to fight it. And that's kind of a normal reaction at first until we really realize you don't fight. What you fight will fight you back. And the devil will win because it cannot be done with flesh and blood. It cannot be done. It has to be done with the authority of the spirit. And so, and the devil does it in our families and boy he hits us where it hurts you know in the weak places you know you see always that you can look at those as you know, blessings to transform us we are being transformed every day well, if we, I'm not learning and growing from God's grace and mercy yeah then I become complacent right. in my relationship right you know so we have to have times of trials we do. Right. But it also is for God's work. Right. You know, right. That's the thing about it is we are not accepting and being transformed every day. We got to wake up and say, hey, God, what are you, where, where do what I need to grow? Show me what I need to see. You know, because he says, outwardly, we are wasting. But inwardly, well, what does it mean in the book of Hebrews when it says everything is going to be shaken except what cannot be shaken? What cannot be shaken in Christians? Christ in them cannot be shaken. Everything else has to be shaken. You see, to wake us up because the body of Christ is asleep. 
And, you know, as sweet and precious as Meryl and Skylar on, it was like little baby, little baby talk. People need more. They need to. Where is the teaching? Where? I mean, we have to have promises that we're putting our faith in. If we're not taught the scripture, we don't know the promises to put our faith in. So we're putting our faith in each other. We're putting our faith in the church. We're putting our faith in everything except God's promise. I mean, we have, I mean, it's all built. It's a, he's a covenant God. So he has promised. What are these promises? Most people don't know. (laughs) You see, and they don't search for God. Show me, show me, just like you're saying. You see, we want an alive church, a, a, a one that we're, you have something to share. Well, you have something to share. You have, everybody has something to share. You know, it's got to be alive. It's got to be a living word. That's why studying the word ought to be just alive every time we read it. And it is to me, and it is to you all, because the Holy Spirit is alive. And if the Holy Spirit is not taught, shame on us. Right. Yeah. Shame on us. I mean, that's all, that's serious because you're putting all the works back on the flesh. If you don't teach that Christ in you is your life, is the source that yeah. we're living from. If they're not teaching that and learning that, you know, this is just my pet peeve that I had for years and years and years. But, you know, this is why this is happening. Mm-hmm. Number one, we've slipped from really searching and finding. I want, I want to know God. I want to know Christ. I want to know my Father. I want to know the indwelling Holy Spirit. I want to know. I want to know that I know. I want to be them. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want just to know them, know them. I want them to be me. Mm-hmm. See? You see, well, that's pretty radical. Then everybody thinks you're saying you're God, which we're not. We're not saying that. But, <laughs> you see, that's why it's happening. And then the the people are under attack all the time, and nobody knows how to handle it. And they just give you baby food at church. They just give you baby food. I don't think they preach enough from the courses. That, that's what we I'm. Don't, we don't right. This is the problem. That's There's exactly right. Coming after us every day. We are in war, and but we want to look and blame it on the medicine or somebody's drug habit or whatever. We're trying to associate the hardship with a real world experience. Yes. But there's a force of evil and if there not, is. If that force is not on you, then you gotta examine who you're walking into right. Because the Bible says you gotta put on the whole. That's right. And it is warfare. You know, but we don't the church never preaches about evil and Satan. It's always this, you know, God's gonna rest you instead of saying you know, how to stand firm. How do you stand firm? Well, you don't know what to stand firm in. <laughs> <laughs> we don't recognize that there's a war. You know what? I, I read this the other day. If you're easy on evil, you're going to be easy on good. I mean, the real good, the righteous good. If you're easy, in other words, you barely, you just let people know there's a devil and blah, blah, blah. But you're you're so vague about it. You see, then you're going to be really vague about what Christ has done to recover you, (laughs) to recreate you. You You see, it it has to come through strong opposites. We have to see exactly what happened to us. We have to see it. And we have to see, you know, and then so many Christians still do have demonic spirits. What do I do? I mean, when I first discovered this, um, it was my first granddaughter. Well, every mother loves their first granddaughter or grandchild, really. And I didn't like her. I didn't like her at all. (laughs) Right. And so I I finally, you know, after she was about eight years old, and I said, Lord, I had, I'm not, not around her all the time, but I didn't like her. Why didn't I like her, Lord? And he said, because she's got a demon. Oh, This child has a demon, yes. And I said, I don't have power over the child, but I do over the demons. And then I thought, how could she get a demon? Well, her other grandmother, and, you know, David's first wife's mother was a Buddhist, and she had little altars, and she would have 
Meg and go to this altar with sacrifices and stuff. Oh. That's how she got it. That's yeah. how she got it. So, and I'm not used to doing this. It was years ago. I'm not used to even thinking like this. Well, mm -hmm, I got it from the, so I thought, if you see it from the spirit, you've got the authority, you, you know, and you'll give it, you, you got it. We've already had the authority. Yeah. And we already have all the authority. So anyway, I prayed for her. And two weeks later, she, and let me tell you, before this, though, I took her to have her um, from DePaul because I thought, is she dyslexic or what's wrong with her? Something's wrong with her. Well, her IQ was like 70. So they wouldn't even have taken her there because she's pretty, she almost retarded. Okay. After I prayed for her, she went to her father, that's my son here, said, and asked him, I want to know Jesus. And she found Christ. Her IQ shot way up. She started making A's. Ah. Uh, yes. I'm telling you, I mean, this is what's happening to our children. This is what's happening to people. Yeah. I mean, well, think about people of the world. I mean, all the video games that they're letting their kids see and all the, and you know, and the porno stuff is just off rampant through the, you know, godly men getting trapped in all that stuff. Well, no wonder everything has to be shaken. And we do, we are in warfare. I mean, yes, we, I live in the joy and the peace of the Lord. I live praising the Lord and all things, even praising what's happening to my son. I mean, you know, I got a little cheer today, but honestly, I have great peace about it. He pretty much does too. But, you know, the bad hadn't come yet. I just want him to be weakened you know, because he thinks he can control everything, yeah. you know, and he has to realize he never has been in control. Mm -hmm. You know, he never has. So, yes, I'm glad it's happening. I'm glad our body of Christ needs to be shaken. I'm glad to hear you talk about um, Meryl and Skylar. Skylar. Um, because that's been heavy on my heart. Because they are so young. They are. And basically, when you look at Meryl, I mean, she is very new. I know it. Become a preacher's wife. And he, let me tell you, he, he doesn't know much either, really. <laughs> and so, I'm and he's about, the preacher. <laughs> so, about they're attractive her. people. Huh? They're very attractive people. Well, they are. Well, so I know it, but it's got to be greater than that, you know, but that's appealing always. But I was thinking about the, the the one minister that has had this uh, big falling from grace. Um, his ministry really ministered to Tom and I. Uh -huh. I've never heard uh, a man explain the gifts of the Holy Spirit like he had. Oh well, like he did. Okay. The thing of it is. It started when he was a brand new preacher. There you go. And it was it was covered up. Mm -hmm. And he never dealt with the sin. His wife helped him in the cover up. A very well known preacher in the world today helped cover it up. And he never admitted it to the Lord and always through the rest of his life it was a pure cover up for the rest of his life and he should have known God was not going to let him get away with it Well, he was going to wait until he got to the peak uh -huh. of his ministry and he, he would be cut down exposed, exposed yeah, yeah. for what he really uh, and if he had just dealt with it in the very beginning, said yes, and, and taken the consequences, whatever they would have been, what a testimony he would have had. I know, but everybody's trying to save the reputation of the church. Right. <laughs> That's what they're trying to save, the reputation of the church. I, I, you know what I think? Jesus doesn't care about our reputation. Actually, he's of no reputation himself, and if he lives in me, he's not going to worry about mine. You see? I mean, 
the world has taken over the church. That's the problem. The world has. It's taken it over. So it's good that it's being shaken. And you know what? Even people like that, that's not the end of his life. I mean, anybody can, I mean, let people like that fall. When you fall hard, you can come up great. I mean, it doesn't mean the end of his life. It might be the beginning. Mm -hmm. And if he was powerful back then, I mean, he could be, I mean, a fall is the greatest thing that can happen to yeah. us. Yeah, you know, but you also look at God's word still went forth. You know, that yeah. you came. You know, you know, even yeah. God can use a donkey. Absolutely. So it's not, yeah. you know, you just take the, the man out of the situation. Mm -hmm. That you That's know. the problem. Most people don't. His, his mm -hmm. word can go forth. Right. You know what? I heard it said that every great man has clay feet. If they did, if they didn't, you would worship the man instead of what God brings you through the, the man, you see. So we're all going to have some clay feet along the way, especially if we're elevated to some place. I mean, you know, we will. But you have that connection. I think, you know, I follow Brahma. I was mm -hmm. for a while. Well, and you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater either. Right. What what you've learned mistake. from them, you but, take from the spirit, not right. from them anyway. And it's, you've got to decipher between the message mm -hmm. and the message. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because God said his word will go forth. It, that's it. It will return forth. That's it. So you have to look at it that way. And so you think they have to be either or. And sometimes there's a mixture yet. But you know, I've been I've been there wrestling is. with this. You know, I have to stop looking at the speck in other eyes because I have to. And you've got to focus on it inside. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if 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 that's my repentance and that's my sin, it's I'm so quick to talk about everybody else, but I have my own. Well, yeah. right. Let's don't talk about other people's sins. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, even Robert Morris, you know, it's just like I say, there's a difference between the message and the message. Yeah, but and some God of them, it. some of the people that are being exposed, are they've really, they've really gone deep, bad, really, really bad. Really bad. I couldn't hear that. What did you say? Some of the people that are being exposed have, have not, it's not just a slip up or a cover up. It's They've really gone really bad. Yeah, that one in Lexington, that, that preacher in Lexington, that was the Lex City. I was, he was a he had a picture. Oh, yeah. He was the yeah. last name that I picked. That was a few years ago, that one. No, it was yeah. recent. It was recent. It was in the news a couple weeks ago. Mm. Well, I say shake up the whole thing. We, yeah. had, we had a time over at, uh, at Polly's we called Shake and Bake. <laughs> <laughs> shake. It needs to be shaken. I mean, that's, that's how God restores people. Let people fall. Let people be shaken. Or, or, I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of my children. Every one of my children have all had horrible, you know, really bad stuff happen to them. Uh-uh, it's made them. It has made them. But I, I, I personally think that the next big revival is going to come out of, like, the upper room experience. It's not going to come. Because people are leaving those churches in droves. It's that, you know, the Bible says we're two or three are gathered. Yeah, and right. I think that's where we're going to You know, because that's when we're like, this is church. Yeah. And, you know, so we're going to a building. I was on a call with, uh, you all know Luke wisely. Yes. Luke, I was talking to him today, and that topic of new, new age, new systems came up. Because he was like, man, he goes, what is the church? He goes, it's so dissolving. What? I used to think the church was it's dissolving in his mind, like, and then he goes to what we call church, and he's like, "This is the church. What is this? Is. I don't even know what this is. Oh, no. Except it's like a, it's just, it's just the tradition that's been passed down. This is mm -hmm. how you do what we call yes, church, it is. as opposed to us just hanging out, just hanging out in the living room or hanging right. out in the cafes, and just talking about the Lord and like yes, the everywhere, anywhere, each of us, and then letting teaching each other how the Holy Spirit is the only teacher you need. Yes, and, right. But there's a new there's there's new systems that need to be built for that too. They do. But those systems will eventually go away. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, right. they'll eventually outlive their usefulness because of what the spirit's doing. You because know? it's always going to be new. It's always going to be new. So there's always going to be change. 
and you have to get in the flow. And some days somebody's gonna be like, we should build a building. Yeah. 200, 300 years from now, we should build a building. Yeah, right. Yeah, they're just talking about that. Wouldn't that be amazing? And it's beautiful and it's vibrant and it's new and it's, I don't know. I'm just making that up as I go, but it's like, yeah. But there's going to be new systems. And so to understand what those systems are, you just have to step well, into that creativity. The problem is it goes back to religion. Right. <laughs> Instead of relationship, it, it follow, just does. People follow the leader instead of they do. Jesus, they do. However, there there right. will be a eventually. You know, like what we call those four levels of becoming an expert, where you be, you you that your believing dissolves into knowing. Yes. Your 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 uh, like that level four is unconscious competence. You're just unconsciously. A child of God. And you exactly. just walk about. I, I know that I know. I am the God. I don't. I, I don't believe I'm that, God's that, I know that is God. enough. You don't That's have to know. You just are. Right. You are, and then and you, you know get, it. Get into the new covenant, which that is, is supposed to be. Here's the gospel. But if you don't have the new covenant, you can't really understand it. Which is, he'll he'll lead you himself. They will all know me. Right. Is what you know. Was it Ezekiel and Jeremiah said? Right. About the new covenant. So. That's where we go. I mean, that's, that's what happened to you all? We recognized it as a, as a man system, and we were doing it wrong. So we stepped out. And that's why we have our, our home group. You know, we don't, we don't have a pastor. We don't, oh, we have a pastor. We just don't have a preacher. Yeah. And we all study the same thing, and we sit and we discuss it each week at different places. Yeah. People's houses. And so, you know, it's not. We all, we have the five-fold ministry active, mm -hmm. right? We just don't have somebody that gets up and tells everybody what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what they got from the message or from the Bible that week. Mm -hmm. We all talk about it. We all read the same thing. We all sit and talk about it. That's great. Some people more than others. But, you know, we're trying to show people that you don't need, like that system is, is a man-made system. Yes, right? it is. That is not what God designed. Uh, that's not what Jesus said what Jesus calls his church. Right. You yeah. don't see the, the Western church model. You don't see that in scripture. Mm -hmm. um, it actually mirrors more of the pagan system and how that was set up. Yes, um, and it how does. It it's yeah. right. There was a... Like a temple going yeah. to the temple. Right. Yeah. That's the modern church. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a spectator instead of participatory. Yes. You know, we're, it's, it's not a call and response. That's, it. that's right. That's what, and God hates that. It's, it's right. layered it's down. Different. But when you go in the Middle East and in Africa, the church is like six hours and it's a testimony of, right. you know, being healed and delivered. And it's it's more about, you know, that part, praising God and glorifying Him, letting the Spirit die. Sitting there for 20 minutes and listening to a preacher and you're out the door. I'd so rather than getting. So condemned in the community right now. He is. It's so bad. The pastors, because and he's free. He that's well, what he's they free. Stand. But he started having healing services on Friday nights. Got put on. Sorry, we're doing this. Uh -huh. And um, they. Oh my gosh, he's gotten like hate letters. And I wish you would die. And like wow, that's the demonic. He does a right. So the demonic is coming. Being exposed mm -hmm. in the bride, oh including the leadership. It is exactly. That's demonic. It is. It is Satan. It's witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Because what he's doing is so biblical. You know, we don't, you know, if you talk about mm -hmm. healing somebody in the church. No, we ought to have, demonic, healing. have healing services. Exorcism. That's one of my favorite know, things. I don't know. It's so fun. Yeah. It's biblical. But and going back to scared of um, even the protocols that some of the practitioners are learning, some of those protocols won't be transferable because God wants to teach you a new, unique thing. So it's like, that's what I love about healing. That's what I love about the prophetic is because God's going to speak to you something very unique where you cannot rely on a pattern apart from his voice. That's the only pattern that repeats is, what are you saying? Because Jesus picked up mud and put on his eyes and spit on them and said, go wash it in it was yes. different every time. No, it's yeah. different. Always different. So uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't hear exactly when you were starting. 
a church that you go to? It's my brother. He's, He's a, a pastor um, in Hardinsburg, Kentucky. Uh -huh. And, um, and he's kind of broken away from the well, he had, I mean, his, his church. I mean, he pulled out of his church. He had a ministry to um, he had an addiction ministry. So he had he was digging people out of the ditch. He created a church out of homeless and drug addicts is what he did. And now they're the largest church in the county. And yeah. the they are not liked at all. They've got a homeless shelter. They've got a halfway house. They, they're these people are getting healed and delivered, and then they're being the church. And then yeah, and right. it's it's right. God's just doing like a them? revival. Oh, the other here comes Toby. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And here comes Toby. So yeah. So it's just it really is revealing. When you start being the Church of Acts, when you really start doing it, you know what? I wanted to. Oh, Kelly, Kelly, yeah, yeah. What came to me today? Because I never really know. I don't ever know what I'm going to do. You, know? you got mad to put on my ass today? No, no. Oh, yeah, I would. I would. <laughs> and you know what? That really represents something. Because, I mean, okay, his spit really was full of glory. And he took mud, which is clay, and he put the glory in the clay, which is what we are. That's, a, that's the wholeness of how we were made. And that's what, and, and healed, healed his eye that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all, it, it's, it's all deep. It all has deep meaning. Yeah. It does. But what... Really, I, I love this in Philippians 3 about how, let's just look at it. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3. That's why I got out, out how do I identify yeah. myself. This little booklet I wrote that long time ago, it's really kind of neat, and it's a little bit elementary, I'm sure, for you all. But anyway, it's good if you might want to take one and share it with somebody else. But how you identify yourself. How do you identify yourself first? You know, we're pretty body-minded. Our mind is set on the flesh, and we're body-minded, see? And then, and so then how do you see yourself? Basically, you know, I'm either beautiful or I'm average or I'm ugly. But I am, your, these I am things you say about yourself. And these, usually you're more body-minded when you're younger. You know, you're, and so I have all these uh, ways that you criteria of how you identify yourself as a as your body then i move into my soul soul minded how i how i feel and how i think and then i have all these ways that we identify ourselves that way so and i say these things think our bodies are precious our soul is absolutely right but that's not who we are that's the point you see, we have to move from understanding that the real me is a spirit being. I'm not, I'm, I have a soul and I live in a body and my soul vacillates and it should. My thinking vacillates. That's a part of my soul that vacillates. And that's really what the Bible says when it talks about the difference between soul and spirit in, in Hebrews. It, it identifies the soul as the joint. And the joint moves all over the place. Well, that's how your mind can move all over the place. You know, your soul, your emotions can move all over the place. You see, all over. So if you live just as a soul person, you see, and a lot of people just want to get their souls fixed. And I say, honestly, you can never get your soul fixed. It will just change to, to in another direction. Because the only way to heal your soul and to recover your soul is to live in spirit. And then the spirit absolutely flows through our soul. That's what heals us, you see. The spirit flows through our soul and then brings it brings us peace, you see. And so, but this just, it, you know, even young people, it's pretty good to look through this. You can have one and maybe, and just go through this and see how you identify yourself. So all my life, I always identified myself with how I felt and how I thought. 
I never even knew I was a spirit person. Did you all? Did you all know that young, at young age? Mm-hmm. Not really. You just think I am what I think and what I feel and, you know, all that. So, and so that, that just, that drives you crazy because it's a roller coaster. Because you're living as if that's who you are. That is not who you are. It's precious and God uses our soul. And why does he use it? Okay, love needs an expression, a way to express out through me, through my soul. Peace expresses out. You see, it's a way of expression. And then soul and body are expression of spirit, you see. So, and then, you know, I really say the real us really is spirit. We're spirit being. We always have been. You know, we're a human spirit, okay? Our human spirit has never been left to itself. You've never just been a human spirit because you've always been joined to a spirit because that's how we're made. We're created to be joined to. And and we are receivers of a spirit. So, So how do you move from that kind of mentality? You see, this is a new consciousness. Really, we're getting we're not getting a new mind, a new consciousness, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing, you know. And so, um, and so, there's an evolution of rising to that. People saw it growing. I, I like to say we're just waking up to what we already are in as as Christians. I mean, um, unsaved people are not, you know, if they are waking up that they have a spirit. You know, they're really indwelt by the by the spirit of error, you know, the lying spirit, the devil, really, people that are not saved, you see. So if they're waking up to that, and it happens even in the the, the, the devils, I mean, they, because, okay, think of us, we're spirit people, we know we have the Holy Spirit, okay, when a person that's not saved and knows, they know they have the devil. And so we know how to operate in the spirit. They know how to operate in the devil. It's the same thing. We move from little children, young men to fathers. First John tells us that, you see. So all of us are born not having Christ. We all have to be born again, even though little kids can see. I mean, we still all of us have to be born again some some way. Sometimes it's early. I mean, sometimes it's four or five years old. And usually, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, God calls us when he's going to call us. Okay, so, but you see, the whole world starts out that way. But then how do you evolve in the devil? Well, you can. (laughs) You evolve just like we evolve in who we are, moving from identifying myself as my body and my soul. And am, am I cute enough? Am I not? I'm ugly or have I got muscles or, you know, all those ways. Or in my soul, what I can accomplish, or am I smart, in, you know, what's my IQ, you know, anything I can trust. <laughs> That's always putting our confidence in the flesh, isn't it? It is. It, it really is. And even though, you know, we want our children to succeed and all that, I'm not against any of that. You all know that. Not against that. But so... And that's really how Paul starts this whole thing, because he talks about his losing his false identity. And that's why I wanted to bring both of these up. And so you're all welcome to have one of these, and you read over it. And I think it's a good thing to give your young people as well. I really think it is. Okay, so Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. I write the same thing to you. I love that he says it this. To me, indeed, is not grievous. In other words, I can be saying the same thing over and over, and I'm not bored. Why? Because it's it's every time you say it, it brings you alive. I mean, the spirit is just moving, you see. But for you, it is safe. I mean, it's good that we repeat ourselves. Why? Because until our minds are really renewed to the truth, you need to be reminded. That's really all it means. We need to be reminded, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And for for we are the circumcision, which worship the Lord in the spirit. Praise the Lord. That's what we do. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and what have no confidence in the flesh. In my soul, soulishness, 
for my flesh. I have no confidence. That takes, how did you get there, Paul? You, you don't get there overnight because he was a Pharisee, totally, probably very intellectual person. You know, we know he was. He was. And the top Pharisee, you have to be very smart. You, you memorize the Torah and have all the prophets and you, you know all the Old Testament prophets and all of it. You see, you know it. And and yet he now he has no confidence in any of that. OK, so you see, that's why Jesus says, unless you lose your life, you're not going to find life, not the true life. Because we've got a false life we're living from, a soulish, fleshly life, really is what people are living from, which is a, a really a self-centered, self-centered life, really. It's a it's a spirit of error. It's the devil's the devil's life, really. Okay, so Christians, if we don't wake up to the fullness of who we are as a spirit person, this will happen. That's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. Because how do they identify themselves as a preacher or as a, you know, what you do? You, you identify yourself as what you do. Well, that's who I am. It's what I do, you know. <laughs> well, and if you're a good doer and if you've uh, got a lot of degrees and you've done really well, then see, all this is confidence in yourself. So, I mean, you have to have a big blow, especially if you're intellectual. No, you don't even have to be intellectual. Even if you have a low IQ, you're still going to be trusted in yourself. So it doesn't matter one way or the other. You will find, the devil will find a way for you to have confidence in your flesh because he reigns in all that. His, that's pride. That's all pride. And that's, the, that's what the devil lives in. Okay, so let's see how he got there. For though I might have confidence in my flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof, he might trust in his flesh. I more. I did it better than anybody. <laughs> I love that. You know. You know. I was a big egotist. I was so proud of myself and what I had accomplished and who I was. What did he? Have? What was he? What did he trust? Okay, circumcised the eighth day. Okay, oh wow. Stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Wow, that was the southern tribe near Jerusalem, was not a part of the northern tribe, who they thought were renegades up in the north, and they were pretty much. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. This, these are all, okay, now think about how we would do it. You know, where I went to school, and who I, you know, grew up with, and I, who I rub shoulders with, and who I can drop names about. You see, all these same things. I mean, this is this is life in the flesh. You see, which is the devil's life. Really, it's not the life of Christ. It's not even my life. That's interesting. As touching the law of Pharisee, meaning I think mean, he's like a lawyer, so clever. Just just brilliantly clever. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. That's how zeal he was. I mean, anything I can do to be right. Anything, you know, okay, okay, I've got to kill them then. You know, and he did. I mean, he put a lot of them in jail. I mean, he drug out the women and the children and had them, you know, mm, you know we don't understand. And listen to the last uh, last part which is of the law. Wait a minute. Concerning zeal, okay, I persecuted the, okay, the church. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Mm -hmm. I kept it perfect. He was outwardly perfect flesh, he thought. This is proof right here that so many people argue about Romans 7. Is Romans 7, was he a Christian? Or I, I, we believe he wasn't even a Christian. Well, this proves that he what he was he was a Christian because this says he kept the law perfectly. Romans seven is fighting in the law. He can't keep the law. You see, so this proves no, he really was a Christian, just like all of us. We all had to die to who we think we are and rise and 
be delivered really delivered from a be, be delivered from a good self okay he's blameless and it and shows you that your own righteousness will not save you never okay so uh okay let, let me stop here before we it starts mm -hmm. telling us and you already read this i'm sure but <clears throat> He didn't come to this easily. I mean, it's not just from one sentence to another, a few sentences down. No, he really, he did have to, you know, after he was saved, he was in Damascus and and I nice laid hands on him. He was, he, he, you know, got his sight back up, filled with the spirit, ran with zeal right away to the synagogue thinking he could tell them, he could argue it, he could, you know, he could convince them. He was still in his own flesh, see, even with the Holy Spirit. He thought he could convince them and right away because he knew it all. But now he knows the Messiah. Now I know the Messiah. I know who the he Jesus was is our Messiah. I saw him, you know, face to face even. You see? So and what happened right away, they uh, they started, they wanted to kill him. And then, you know, the Jews heard about him being there and have had happened to him. And so they, you know, he ran off. He had to run. Why? Because now, where is the power? Where was the power that he used to have? A lot. Didn't he have a lot? A lot of power? What he could say? I mean, now he was, he was being groomed to be second in command of Camellia? Absolutely. Now, where's the power he has to run? Where's the power? I'm a Christian. You would think, now, wait a minute. See? It's not the same now. Yeah, he has to run. He was let down in a basket. That's an embarrassment. Women had to be let down in the basket. Wait a minute. And then, you know, and then I know it says in Acts that he went back to uh, 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 Paul of Tarsus. He was in Tar for a while. And then, but he went to Arabia. Galatians tells us this. He went to Arabia. Why? He had to find out how this worked. Why did why why was he a coward? He was always he was a big guy. Now he's a coward. He can't. He doesn't have the power. What, what you know? I'm telling them the truth. They won't hear me. How come? <laughs> See, they want to kill me now. Now I'm on the run. <laughs> I, everything that they did, everybody did to him. Now I mean, what he did to everybody else is they're doing it to him. So God has to break this great man down. It's the only way any of us are really going to come to see that. Because this is radical. This is a new mind. This is a new spirit. This is a new attitude. This is a new being. This is all new. New identity. Everything new. And so, and there's a lot to drop off, to lose. So God has to weaken these powerful people. That's what I know about my son. He's a powerful man. And God has to weaken him. And I'm thinking of dad now. Dad, I mean, somebody said, and people are starting to ask me to go different places. And my friend Bill said, well, here you are, 80 and 83 or whatever. And now they're asking you. I said, God has to get us very weak. If he's going to move in powerfully through us because we'd all take the credit. We'd all be tempted to. Right. <laughs> so, so he had to break him down. And then build him up. And that, you know, it's it's like when you go to, in the service, you go to Paris Island, and how they break you down in the service. You know, so you don't even, don't even have your own thoughts. You can't have, you, you, you have to absolutely do exactly what they say when they tell you. Well, that, we're trained like that sometimes. You see, we are trained because we don't do anything until you know here. We can't do anything. How many times have we not? How many times have we jumped out? No, I got to do, you know, no. Nope. Mm -mm. Do we go pray for somebody? Not unless I find, do I, I would pray for anybody, but do I go get them delivered until I know? No, not unless I know. Why? Because they could ask seven more in that place if they don't know it. It's dangerous, really. It's dangerous. It can be dangerous. It can be. So you have to know. We have to hear, just like you're already saying just exactly what you are teaching, what you are believing is true, is the only way. 
the only way. So, so then it says, but what things was gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. And this, this didn't happen overnight either. It did not. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. That's, that's a divine knowledge. That's not spiritual information. <laughs> it's revelational knowledge of really to know God. And in a sense, he had to lose his mind. Now, okay, to really understand and have the mind of Christ. Now, does that mean, okay, then he forgot everything that he knew before? No. What happens then? How, how does that happen? I mean, okay, God loves intellectual people. God loves people that, he, that can know things quicker than other people. That, you know, he help, calls us all. Yes. What happens once we lose the dependency on our mind, mm -hmm. you see, then, and we're trusting the mind of Christ, okay, then our natural mind is sanctified. Mm -hmm. Now, he now he gives us wisdom even in our natural life about everything. You see, he shows you the truth behind all yes. your knowledge. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That's what happened to Paul. He knew everything. He knew all the scriptures. He just didn't know. He didn't. Know. He inside. had no insight about what they how, how to trans. Mm -hmm. You know, he had to have the spirit's transformation to really see the difference. I mean. You know, sometimes you read stories in the Old Testament, and then you read them in the New Testament and think, wait a minute, they seem different. Well, like Sarah did laugh, mm -hmm. but then in Hebrews it said she didn't. Why? Because that's being interpreted by the Holy Spirit. He knew her heart. But that's why. And so it sounds it sounds a little different, you see, because it's being reinterpreted by the Spirit. So we have to understand that. So everything he knew had to be reinterpreted. In the spirit. So I'm sure it would. And when he started getting insights like that, I'm sure he was excited. I mean, it really, it, it was it, nothing like it. Because then you can take everything and absolutely see from beginning all the way through exactly what God intended, what God's purposes are, and how you're a part of that. And of course, his calling was a hard calling because he was called to suffer. <laughs> That was his first calling. I mean, why do you, you come into Christ and you're, that's your first thing that God calls you to, that you will suffer for his name's sake? <laughs> well, somebody said the other day, when a person joins the service, they know, they're signing it, they know their life could be taken. They know that, and they're signing in. <laughs> you see? You see? So we, we sign in for the same type of thing. Now, I mean... We've had it really great. We really all have. We've all had it really great. And, you know, it might always continue. I think it's always going to be great regards because we're always going to be led in, in, in victory and triumph, just like triumph, like what she says all the time. Mm -hmm. You see, we always are. Even in jail, they're singing songs and getting released and all that. You see, once we know, we know. You see, once we know. So whether... That's why he says, I've learned, he says this in Philippians, I've learned to be content. Mm -hmm. Learned. That means it didn't come easy. I learned to be content when I'm abased. And I learned to be content when I'm abound. Why do you have to learn to be content when you're abound? Well, because that could tempt you off. It could be worse if you abound too much, you see. It could be. So, and so, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, all things, you see. So we've signed up for a life that's not our own. It's not our own life. There's nothing about my life. I don't have my life. That's the ultimate truth. It is. Because I was seeing one of the songs Sunday that says he came to save my life. No, he didn't. He came to be it. He came to be my life. He didn't come to save it. <laughs> He came for us to lose it so that we could find his the true self or true life in Christ. Okay, so I'm not going to be standing up saying, that's wrong. Oh, Derek Nazi? No, I know. <laughs> I'm the worst. 
I might be. Well, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll take turns, okay? But anyway, I love all this. My, for the excellency of the knowledge, uh, th that is that is not just intellect or not even spiritual understanding. Knowledge is know-how as well. The know-how, the ways of the spirit as well. You know, that's why Psalms 103, 7 says, children of Israel knew God's acts. They saw the miracles, but they didn't know his ways. Moses knew his ways. This is the kind of knowledge it's talking about. To know his ways, to know, to know, like you know, I already know about our son that has cancer. Okay, I say um, he doesn't have it. You know, it doesn't really have him. And but it's going to prove it's going to prove the real him because I know the real him. I know the real him. Dad knows the real him. We know we know who's going to rise. So, <laughs> all right, that's the kind of knowledge. You see, the knowledge, you understand all the pain, why suffering, why Satan, why, you know, why all the negative, why God doesn't heal everybody. He doesn't. So he does most, but not everybody, you know. Okay. Of whom I have suffered, now this is huge, suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, suffered the loss of all things. This most radical thing. You know, because it's the only self you've ever known. I knew a man that was really having a breakdown in his mind. And I said, well, you know, the Bible says we have to lose our life. That doesn't say we have to lose my mind. And I said, I think your mind's a part of your life. <laughs> you know, and so I said, just hold on. See what God's going to do with this. <laughs> this isn't the final word. You know, you will rise, you know, and God will bring will bring you forth to him. And he has. He's done all that in this man. You see. Okay. Count it as done. So <laughs> this is weird, but you know, sometimes I will get Christmas messages from people and they'll tell me everything their child's doing and how great. And I'm happy for them. But it's still kind of this is really what Christmas is Christmas is about. Is all the accolades of all the grades and the degrees and all that. No, don't think so. Okay. That I might win Christ. I might be him. That's how we win him. We be him. That's right. And be found in him not having my own righteousness. See, that's that's Romans 7. Because Romans 6 is finding out that I'm really dead to sin or the sin nature. 7 is finding out that I don't have my own goodness. <clears throat> that, I think that's harder for nice little people like me. And I was a nice mother and a good mother and did good things. I took care of my family and did all the nice, sweet things. It was kind of a shock for me to find out that I didn't have my own goodness. <laughs> you see, it's a shock. That's why Jesus. And a relief. Yeah, a relief. Yeah, right. Yeah. And a relief. That's exactly Wait. right. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have to produce goodness. Don't have to do it. You mean I can really say what I think? <laughs> you might not like me now. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. <laughs> which, which is of the law? Righteousness, which is of the law? That's Romans 7. That's, that's what that is. And now, you know, he's not, he doesn't, he realizes that he cannot keep the law blamelessly. Actually, keeping the law blamelessly is the death, is through the devil. If you're doing it by your flesh, it's the devil. It's perfect devil. Because <laughs> Christ didn't do it that way. No, the devil does. Okay. Uh huh. That, okay, which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. There's the, there's the release. Oh, my gosh. And then. Here's the power. There's the power. Now, this is how he found the power, with the, where the real power had to come from. Had to come 
from the, and he was already anointed with the Spirit. I mean, Ananias laid hands on him, he got the Holy Spirit. He didn't know the ways of the Spirit. People, this is all very immature in a person. And so you have to wake up, wake up to, and then experience. You have to experience. Yeah. Experience is vitally important. It's not just getting, oh, I got all this here. You know, and getting the principles of it and all that. That's wonderful to learn all that. That's wonderful. Nothing wrong with it. But it's going to be through experience that we really know. You know, there was a time in my life, and of course, I was just, when I was in high school, I had chemistry lab. I like chemistry. But anyway, half of it was theory. The other half was a lab. And when I went through my time, uh, uh, the Lord says, now I want you to close your book like you did in chemistry class. And I'm going to take you into the lab now to show you how it works. Because we got to know how how does this work? How does this naturally work? In, how's this going to work in my life? That's when I that's when I wrote Treasures of Darkness because I could see it. I could see it, but I really came through before I could see. You know, I could. I had to really come, which took a while. Took a long while. Okay. So, and the whole point is that I might know Him and the power of his resurrected life. There's the power right here, but it's not my power. Then I might know the power of his resurrected life. So it's his life. It's not map. Now I've got power now. It's not that. No, no, no him. Knowing him is being one with him. That, that it's, it's being him. It's being him. And then you experience in your life the power of his resurrection. And when I knew that, I, I felt like I was above and I could start seeing big pictures now instead of, you know, just worrying about every little detail of everything. I could start. It's like I was an eagle. That's why I put an eagle on that book, on the, on the front of that book, because you're above and you see and you can really see where people are. You can see what is going on. And when it's very powerful. So that resurrection power. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, I know that's your all's favorite verse, and I'm it's ours too. Not, well, I'm not understanding it very well at the moment. How do you describe resurrection power? It's not your power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that raises you from the dead. Okay. Because they, he, we've been planted together in his death. And now we're planted together, or we're one with him in his resurrection. So uh, we, we experience both. Being that's, that's Romans 6 says that. Since you're planted, in other words, it says we're baptized into his death. That does. I know water baptism is great. That's, I'm not against that at all. But we've got to really, that's not really, it's not talking about water baptism there. It's talking about me being put into his death, and I know it. Then I died when he died. And then when he came out of the grave, I came out as a new being. I'm born again, really. I'm a new creation, and I know it. You see, so we, it's really, it, it, it so really. The power, the power is what makes that happen. Yes, it's hit of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit within us is the power of his resurrection. That's right. And no, yes. Yeah. Yes. I was. I was uh, joining uh, Brett Burroughs last last night, and he was talking about baptism, and he was saying that baptism is basically another picture of union with Christ. That basically we become one with Him in His death. So it's really all about oneness. So it seems to me like that's what I what I'm saying too. Brett yeah. and I are saying the same thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, we it's usually super do. powerful. It is. That's yeah. right. That is right. We're one with him in his death. We, I always say, I've been saying this for years. Jesus was not a lonely savior there 2,000 years ago or however many years ago. We actually, all creation was in him. <laughs> Says that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world into himself. Does, it does not mean ultimate reconciliation. That's where it goes wrong. A lot of people take it that way. No, the, the, it's, it's potentially been done for everybody, but it's not going to be actually done for you until you exceed, receive it. 
So it's on the potential. It's potentially so it's it is actually already done, but it's not gonna be real to you until you take it. And so people only go to hell because they refuse it. They refuse that they already are, they've been they've been forgiven, they already are, you know, in Christ. They they're not in Christ. I'm not saying that, but you know, the the whole whole plan of salvation is already there for them. It's already been done. What? See, I've not thought about it like this ever until tonight. Okay. That Philippians 3 where it talks about you're making the comparison between 3 and Romans 7. Mm -hmm. Paul top in 3 says, you know, according to the law and mm -hmm. righteousness, blameless. Mm -hmm. But later on, he's like, but then I realized I, I can't keep this and it requires uh, a new way of faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, he says, I need deliverance. But you are saying that if there's a proof, you know, that Romans 7 was, no, he's a Christian. Yeah. And uh, God is frustrating. Yes. Like, yes. flesh but, will not profit you now yes. that you're in this. Yes. What, well, if all creation was in Christ on the cross, mm -hmm. is, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this. I don't know. Is, are people that are out of sight of Christ still experiencing the fruit and benefit of like a flesh life the way that they would pre-cross? Or are they experiencing a type of Romans 7 frustration? You it know depends what I mean? where the Spirit has them. I mean, they, they, they could be, if, they start, if they're starting to have a, a conscience about that they're not right. They're not. They're not right. Yeah. Then that's when they would start feeling that, which is really started the conviction of the spirit. Most of the time, people, they everything they do, is, they think they're right. You know, what I always say: self righteousness is not just some little old lady like me with the Bible under her. You know, always flipping it open and making judging everybody else. Everybody's self rightness. It's their own self right. Even a drug addict or uh, one that. You know, sells drugs. They they get out every morning out of their bed if they have one, and they're doing it. They're doing the right thing for them. That's self, still self rightness, self righteousness. You see, it it goes both ways. It goes, we're all self righteous until we know the righteousness of Christ, His righteousness as us. You know, you see. So I think it depends on where and the it's spirit. It's a strange question, but it's like when you think of Christ died, therefore all died. Yes. But they received okay. the benefit of that death, yeah. Okay, let me tell you this. Even an unsaved person, just like we can be tempted downward to, to sin, a sinful person can be tempted upward and do righteous, do a righteous act occasionally. It doesn't mean they live there. Yeah. You know, and it's not who they are. But I mean it happens. It, like Cyrus he was a, what was he, an idol worshiper and let all of Israel go. He wasn't a righteous man, you see, but he did a righteous act by God. You see what I'm saying? God came to him, don't. Yes, exactly. Right. So unrighteous people can be tempted upward. See, just like we can be, be tempted downward. That's, isn't that to interesting? Old, yeah. Yeah. To sin, and they can be tempted upward to right. Look like, you know, somebody that's lost, he's a fireman, he saves somebody, goes in and sacrifice, almost sacrifices his life and gets burned, but he does this. Everybody, clap. Well, how, how do we know that's great and good? Because it's self sacrificing. But, well, how do we know that? Why do we know that's good? Because, you see, we all really have that much light in us to know that that is good, you see? And, I mean, he did a righteous act. He might go to, end up going to hell. You don't know. He might not be born again, see? So, it, and people that are in the service, they do that. And you see, it, it usually leads people to Christ when... That happens to them, like because it's it's just so wonderful to experience something that's that I've sacrificed, but it's really brought another person through. It really is. It's it could lead people. I think your question can only be answered by where the person is in the spirit, and where if the if the Holy Spirit's after. And I think the Holy Spirit's. I can't. I don't know. 
who's called and who who isn't. I mean, I, I could tell you this, the hybrids are not called. <laughs> Sorry, they're not. The what? The hybrid people. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're not. They're that would not. That'd be non-human DNA. Yes, that's exactly right. Why? Because... They can't be redeemed. Why can't they? You tell me. Because it's defiled. Okay. And only... And Christ was perfectly human, and the sacrifice has to be just like what it's saying. Okay, that's that's Part the answer it, right yeah. there. That's the answer. Christ did not come to save half breeds. Right. He can't. He didn't come to save angels and and mixed it mixed it breed. Right. He came to save man. Right. We have to have Adam's DNA. That's why he's the kinsman. Redeemer. Yes, kinsman the redeemer. redeemer. His kind. Yes. Because an intercessor has to be like who he intercedes. Yeah. He has to be. <laughs> you already are one. Girl. I just, I just want to come All right. All right. <laughs> let's, let's go. All right. Now, I want you to notice how this verse says it. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Okay. He, his spirit is resurrected in me as me. It's as me, see? It's as if it's me. It's not really me. It's his resurrected life in me. But it's as if it's me. Seems like me. Feels like me. I walk it out like it is me. That's why it's so hard for people not to get impressed with themselves. Because it feels... Especially, in ministry. Yeah, yeah it, it is. It's hard. It's really a temptation not to be so impressed with your gift or, the you know, or what God does through you. When God starts move, moving through you, you're 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 not going to be able to help it. You're going to be so impressed. Why? Especially if you've never had anything like that happen to you before. And you know, I always thought I was too dumb or too this or too that. You know, and I would think, oh my gosh, I really can't understand the Bible. You know, shock. You see. So in, in a sense, you can't. And that we could go over to Luke. 10 and go over that one. Rejoice not. Yeah. In the power of yeah. it that your names are written. Yeah. Well, you know, when they came back after he sent them out and they came back and they were, they were really, I mean, you, everybody would be so excited what just happened. If that happened to us, we'd all come in. Do you know what, what is happening to you? Oh my gosh, what did you see like this? And he says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. That's a bad thing to say. Why, why would Jesus say that? I think it means a lot. I think when when the Holy Spirit moves through us, pride could rise, and and being self elevated could rise. That's the that's the deal. But he also saw when they as they were moving in the spirit, the principalities and they were their power was falling. That's what he saw. He also saw Satan fall. You see, yeah. So that, that it, was that was Satan's whole thing was was pride. Yes, because, it was. Because God worked through through Satan because Satan was a light bearer. And so right. Satan thought, oh, it's me. Look what I'm doing. Well, well there, there's pride again. You know? That's right. And that was his fault. That's why it's humility that we come before the Lord. We come before the Lord. We worship the Lord in humility and in joy. I mean, you know, we enjoy and and. But it is humility. I mean, I, I'll tell you all, one time when I was at Polly's, I was so anointed. I felt like it was on the ceiling. And when I stood up, I thought, well, wasn't that good? And then I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> immediately. Yeah. But it happens immediately. Right. Yeah. There was a lady that did training with our team just around the prophetic. She said, um, when you move from just giftedness and into he said this is a shift that can happen when you move you start you start ministering to people out of god's heart mm -hmm. and so as opposed to just having a gift where it's like that's a hammer right. you can always hammer a nail because you yeah. got the hammer you can always hammer the nail but it doesn't require god's character that's right she said that when you start operating in a ministry mode always start with asking god to feel what he feels for the person in that mode you can't you're like i was weeping over strangers doing that and i'm like you can't that is you can't that's a take, wonderful thing to say you can't take on pride in that 
when you approach it from that perspective. When you have really compassion. The, he, he the did, power flows through the emotion that God's feeling and putting it in. It's compassion. It's compassion. Usually a mercy, compassion. Yeah. He said a lot of times he, he would have compassion. And but it's I've not seen some pity. people. It's see, not pity. You've seen people that just get what they want because they have the gift. Yeah. But then, but you, it's almost clinical. Yeah. In that they're not approaching the person out of God's affection. Yes, exactly yeah. right. It's his desire. Yeah. I know. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just thinking of a oh, time yeah. that I that I that happened to me. But anyway, I want you to look at how this says it. His his resurrection. Then, but the next verse, I was at a black church one time, and they had a picture with this that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. And I said, Pastor, that's only half the verse. He said, I don't want the other half. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because the fellowship of his suffering? You mean it's not even me suffering? You know, like my mother said, this is not happening to me, Sylvia. It's happening to Jesus. <laughs> there was this old movie, and it was like, it was probably in poor taste because they were making fun of the three wise men. Mm -hmm. And Mary was like, hey, thanks for bringing the gold and the frankincense. Mm -hmm. Next time, don't worry about the myrrh. You don't have to bring so much myrrh or something like that, but it makes me think of, hey, we like the whole, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Uh, leave out that suffering. We don't, part. We don't want any of the fellowship of his suffering. And I went, oh my gosh. Well, I think you swallowed the whole thing. I don't think you can take part of it. And, and I've always wondered about this next part, being made conformable unto his death. And I want to tell you all what I think about that. When I read the book of John, he leaves out the negative, the human negative part of Jesus. He leaves it out. He doesn't talk about the 40 days when he was tempted. And he only has one verse about Gethsemane. Why? He's very young. And he had seen only the great Jesus, all the miracles and all that. Okay, that's, that's part of it. But the other part of it is what about the negative what about, you see, okay, just think about in Gethsemane. They had just seen the miracle worker. Everything that came out of his mouth that was just like magic, you see? It was just from another world. And now all of a sudden he's down on his floor, crying out, asking God to deliver him, and crying and sweating and, you know, you know, they would think, that's that's our Savior? Okay. You see, because they had, because John really, at that time when he wrote the book of John, couldn't really deal with that, the negative part. He couldn't, he didn't really understand it yet. That's the only way I can take it. Because uh, those, that's very important. You don't really get to see his humanity. You know, until there he is, there he is crying with strong tears and fear. You know, take this cup from me. Okay, this is a part. Now he's moving into the intercessory role of a priest. The priest suffers. You know, the king reigns and everybody does what the king says. And every spirit masters, you see. But the priest is the one that lays down his life. Now he's the lamb. Now he's becoming the lamb. They don't. Everybody wants the lion. Nobody wants the lamb. So I think it's only immaturity that John, because he certainly got it. I mean, he wrote Revelations, right? <laughs> so he really understood it. So I think we have to be made conformable unto his death. Once we've lived in he getting people healed, getting, you know, the spirit moving mightily, you know, a lot of manifestation of the spirit. Then all of a sudden, you know, things come and, you know, reduces us down. And we think, what's wrong? What happened? What did I do? What What's wrong here? Something. I mean, I felt like that. I felt when it started happening to me, you know, because the first thing you think is, what did I do wrong? Well, no, you have to be made comparable under his death. <laughs> He'll take you through it, you see. He'll, because as intercessors, we will suffer, really, because, because death will work in us, but life works in others, because we're always 
giving life to others. Everything is redeemable. Everything that we experience, every positive thing, every negative thing is redeemable and for others, always for others. My, my mother died, you know, you know, knowing that what that she what she was suffering was going to be passed to glory to her to her generation, and you know she never. I'll, I'll hate for you to leave. Yeah. I'll be back. I'll All right. Well, I love you. I love you too. I think you're great. Okay. You've had great things to say. He's great. Okay, I know. <laughs> But we have to be made conformable if we've been so powerful and had all the. You see what I'm saying? We actually. We do. We do. You all. You all have to go to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just let me. I've finished. But let me just finish two more okay. little points here. Okay. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, what's that talking about? Gaining an intercession, gaining a, uh, we talk about gaining a position in the spirit it, through suffering. You see, you gain, you as you suffer with him, you will reign with him. You'll do both. You will suffer and you will reign. Okay, you then you gained a position in the spirit for the dead. Could be for somebody lost. It's not a dead in the grave person. He's not talking about that. Talking about dead people walking because people are dead in their trespasses and sins. You see, people we want saved, people we want to know who they are. You see, that's that's what you're gaining. If you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. That means you're not just why does this happen to me? Me, 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 me. That's not suffering with him. Suffering with him is praising him along the way with gritted teeth, even. <laughs> You see, it is. Okay. And 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 then the next verse goes with it, and then I'm then you y'all can go. Okay. <laughs> Dismiss. No. I'm sorry. Not as though I had already attained. Now I wanted to answer that. This next part, the reason I want to answer that is because he acts like he hadn't already gotten through. What he's saying here, and I got light on it. I, I remember the road I was on when I was in my car getting light on this. I remember I was by a railroad track. Because I kept saying, Lord, I know he's not talking about that he doesn't know who he is. He does. He knows his oneness with Christ. What could this be then if he says, I haven't already attained? He means, okay, just because he made it through. I mean, we are really a multi-membered body. The whole body of Christ hasn't attained, you see. So as, as that in that sense, he hasn't attained because now everybody's through. You see, you see what I'm saying? That's what it really means. Then it means not as though I've already attained. And this kind of intercession is what he's talking about too. He's for these churches. And remember, you know, in Second Corinthians, when he talks about everything that happened to him was nothing compared to the inner agony that he had because of the churches. Because as soon as he would, I mean, just think of what he suffered. It wasn't the outer suffering. It was the inner agony of having people saved, having people delivered, having people have the Holy Spirit. And then the Judaizers come and the devil comes and the wolves come and destroy everything. Or it looks to be that way. You see, and he has to believe it's not. He has to die to everything he sees and believe, no, they're going to make it. Let me tell you, a lot of intercession is dying to what you see and know and believing what is impossible. That's intercession, really. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's why it talks about that in Second Corinthians 10, when it talks about taking every thought captive, even to the obedience of Christ. You know, every high thing, what high thing? A big me, an independent me, is every high thing. Take that captive. You see? And so, because, okay, here we're walking around and we're positive. We have great things. The next day, some horrible thing. I mean, it's just going to, outwardly, it's going to be just stuff all the time. Right? Is it happening all the time? Yes. Yes, it is. 
you know, that's why it says, don't worry about tomorrow. The evil of the day is going to be plenty for you. <laughs> you see, of what's, what could be happening, you see? So that's why it says judge not after appearances. Because when you go places, I do judge. You know, I, I went to that precious, their precious church. And I know they're precious people. They're just babies, really. And I know what's coming down. Yeah, I know that. And I know that, but I want to be praying for them. Like Jesus said to Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But I pray for you. That's what I want us to do mm -hmm. for them, for Skylar and Merrill. We need to stand in faith. And I love it that you've had them on your mind too, Judy. Yeah. Uh, I, there was something that um, early on that the Lord impressed on me, and I, I think it was impressed on me when we were all this came out, yeah, about uh, rock divorce and just realizing this was in the very, very early, young, young man, and that Scour is a very, very young man. And, you know, and the attack, he, you know, he, he needs us to really cover him, cover him in prayer. I want our hope. That's what I'd love for our fellowship to really. Narrow yeah, yeah, question. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. what, what attacks are these? Or is there something specific that's happening? No, no. no. Oh, okay. Let's see. Sorry. We're talking about Meryl and Tyler. Oh, okay. no, they really need They don't know a whole lot. They are the Okay. And they're both very young. Yeah. Oh, they're um they're they're very vulnerable in their business. Yeah. Uh got a got a message. 